turn with me this morning in your Bibles to the ninth chapter of the book of Genesis. The ninth chapter of the book of Genesis. As we continue our study of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. In December 11th of 2008, one of the largest investment scandals in history was revealed when Bernie Madoff was arrested by federal prosecutors and charged with securities fraud after having confessed that his investment business was nothing more than a Ponzi scheme. The story of the Madoff family is a tragic one. In June of 2009, Bernie was sentenced to 150 years in federal prison where he died in 2021. His brother Peter, who was complicit in the scheme, was sentenced to 10 years in prison, was just recently released. In 2010, Bernie's son, Mark, a married father of four, was found dead in his apartment, having committed suicide at the age of 46. Bernie's other son, Andrew, and his wife, the parents of two children, separated in 2007. He'd been diagnosed with cancer in 2003, but had been in remission. His cancer returned in 2011, and he stated that he believed its return was due to the stress of the fallout over his father's crimes and the suicide of his brother. Andrew died in September of 2014 at the age of 48. Bernie's wife, Ruth, who had lived an incredibly opulent and glamorous lifestyle prior to her husband's arrest, was shamed and humiliated and ended up ultimately living alone and isolated in a one-bedroom apartment in Connecticut. But the tragedy of Bernie Madoff's sins were not limited to his immediate family. The victims of his fraud totaled nearly 37,000 people in 136 countries. Some victims, including those who could barely afford to invest in the first place, lost their entire life savings, and several of them later committed suicide as a result of their losses. Many of his victims came from the Jewish community where Madoff had been a major philanthropist. Among them was Nobel Peace Prize winner and Holocaust survival survivor, Uh, Eli Wiesel, many of you are familiar with him. His foundation lost $15.2 million. We thought he was God. We trusted everything in his hands, Wiesel said in 2009. In the tragic story of Bernie Madoff, we see how the consequences of one man's sin impact not only those close to him, but also extend far beyond him even impacting directly or indirectly the lives of future generations, most of whom were never party to that sin. In our text this morning, we find another tragic story of sin, sin which led to the breakdown of a family and ultimately the corruption and ultimate curse of a nation. But the good thing that we see in this story is that with cursing often comes blessing. And this father's sin, though it led to Cursing also brought about great blessing, a blessing which even benefits us today. Look with me to this morning at Genesis 9, and we'll be looking at verse 18 down through the end of the chapter, at verse 29. This is the word of the Lord. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their father's Their faces were turned backwards, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. And let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived for 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years. And he died. This is the word of the Lord. 
you're taking notes this morning, there are three points here to this sermon that kind of follow the, the course of the story. The first is this, the tragic fall of Noah, followed by the shameful sin of Ham and the curse and blessing of nations. In verse 20, we read that following the flood, Noah began to, it says, be a man of the soil. In other words, he was a farmer. He became a, a farmer. Most specifically, he became a, a, a man of the vineyard. He planted a vineyard for the purpose of producing wine. And in verse 21, we are told that he drank of the wine of his vineyard, and in so doing, he became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. Noah, you, you, as you have seen, is put forth as the faithful man of righteousness in the preceding story, but here he is described as drunken and exposed, humiliated and shamed. Some scholars have, have insisted that Noah, is, Noah was innocent in this, that nowhere in the story is there a criticism of Noah's drunkenness, so therefore this was just an accident, an accidental mistake. They they claimed that, that this was unintentional. Noah was surely unaware. You know, he's coming out of the flood. He plants a vineyard. He was unaware of the power of wine. He, was, he wasn't understanding what was going to happen to him. Surely a man of Noah's stature, a man as righteous as he, would not behave in such a way. But it's interesting to note that there's no support for this. In fact, if you look at Matthew chapter 24, if you remember Jesus there in the Olivet Discourse is telling his disciples that as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. And listen to how he describes the days of Noah. He says, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. The eating and drinking there was not just your ordinary eating and drinking, it was festivities. It was, it was speaking of drinking to the point of drunkenness, partying and celebrating. So there's, it's, it's highly unlikely, almost impossible, that Noah would not have known what wine would do. It would seem that this is a simple way to try to preserve the character of this biblical hero, to whitewash his foibles and his failures. But you know, one thing that's interesting about the scriptures is they do not allow us this luxury. The Bible, unlike many other works of religion, do not present us with heroes who are flawless, who are in no need of salvation. In fact, that's one of the, uh, one of the attestations of the authenticity of the scriptures and the reliability of the scriptures is that they present those, if you were going to build a religion, you would want all of the leaders of that religion to be perfect and flawless men, men you could follow. But most all of them, in fact, nearly all of them, are proven to be failed men, right? As, as the old saying goes, the best of men are men at best, and that is very true. Peter, the head of the church, is one of the, the, the most uh, foolish men in, in the Gospels. He is constantly putting his foot in his mouth. He is constantly failing. He denies the Lord three times. And we see that here with Noah. Friends, always remember this. There's only one hero in the Bible, and that is God himself. He is the only hero. Never put your faith and hope in a man, whether he be a biblical hero or whether he be a man living in this day. Do not put your hope in princes. Do not put your trust in chariots and horses, as the scriptures remind us. So here we find Noah. The scene is awful. He is drunk. He has taken his clothes off and he's laying there in the tent, naked and exposed, utterly shameful. This man who had found favor in the eyes of the Lord, described as righteous, blameless in his generation, had walked with God, now lay sprawled out in a state of utter humiliations. And Noah's actions, of course, here justify the warnings of Scripture concerning wine. This is a clear, if there ever was one, a clear example of the danger of wine. Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Proverbs 23, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine. Friends, while the Bible does not forbid the consumption of wine, it couches its permission with an abundance of caution. 
The Old Testament and the New Testament are filled with descriptive warnings concerning alcohol, like the ones we find in the story of Noah. In other words, they tell a story that we're to learn from, but they also give us prescriptive warnings, like those found in Proverbs, prescriptions, meaning things that are to be obeyed, things that are to be followed. In Scripture, the instructions concerning the use of wine are, are similar to those concerning the use of sex. Psalm 104, wine makes glad the heart of man. It's a beautiful thing. Proverbs 5, drink from your own cistern. Let your wife, Solomon says, uh, let your wife alone satisfy you sexually. But beware, wine mocks and destroys, and sex with the forbidden woman destroys. Both wine and sex are gifts from God that must be handled with great care. When, When misused, they destroy the one who partakes of them. Many a man and many a home have been destroyed by alcohol. Many of you in this room can attest to that. My own family can attest to that. So many young people I see on social media with drink in hand, blurry eyes, smiles on their faces. Friends, many of those young people will end up in a state of humiliation not dissimilar to that of Noah. Remember, to be holy is to be entirely devoted to God. To give oneself fully to him for his use. And one of the greatest hindrances to holiness is our appetite. Our appetites for for things that, even gifts that God has given us for our good and for our joy that we misuse and we abuse and we destroy ourselves with them. Be careful of that. I saw a one of those PSAs, maybe you remember this, back in the 1980s, a father comes in and he opens up a, a, a little box with marijuana and drug paraphernalia. Do you remember that PSA for those of you that grew up in the 80s? And he's yelling at his son, son, why would you do this? I found this. And then he says, where did you learn this from? And finally, the son, exasperated with his father, says, I learned it from you, dad. I watched you. And the PSA ends this way. Children who use drugs have parents, or parents who use drugs have children who use drugs. Fathers, be careful. Mothers, be careful with the gifts that God has given. Do not use them. Do not abuse them. Here we see that drunkenness has reduced this great man of God, this preacher of righteousness to utter shame and humiliation. And if it can happen to him, it can happen to you. When Noah awoke from his drunken stupor, he realized that he was naked, and he begins to piece together what happened while he was unconscious. Noah, like so many, a man who, had come, who would come after him, a man of great integrity, a man who was held up as blameless and righteous before God and men, his life had been exemplary, he had obeyed God, he built the ark, he was a preacher of righteousness, Hebrews tells us, he had faithfully shepherded his family through the flood, he had come through this incredible test, this incredible trial, offering a sacrifice of thanksgiving and repentance, received the blessing of God in the covenant, but here he comes off the ark and he lets down his guard. He, he failed to heed the words of the Lord to his forefather Cain. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Friends, there is a lesson here for all of us. We see often in Scripture that great victories are often followed by great failures. While in the midst of the trial, our eyes are fixed on the Lord. Have you experienced that where you're in the midst of a trial? I see this all the time. I cannot tell you how many young men, young married men I have seen in 21 years of ministry show up at church broken, eyes fixed on Jesus because their wife has left them. But they are not pursuing Jesus. They're not pursuing him. How many times, though, has that happened? The, the, the fixation is on the Lord. And then, and then when we get what we want, when we, the trial has passed, what happens? Their guard is let down. We sense the gravity of the battle, the exhilaration of the fight while in the midst of it. But then the fight is gone. And the exhilaration is gone. And, and suddenly, we find ourselves on the rooftop of the palace like David. We, we find ourselves strong and powerful. 
resting on the couch with, with women like, Sol- or like uh, Samson. We, we find ourselves wise and wealthy like Solomon or, or cocky and arrogant like Peter on his way to Gethsemane. Friends, we cannot let down our guard because the enemy does not let down his. He is crouching at the door waiting to devour us, to sift us. Noah has witnessed the awful judgment and the great salvation of God. He has seen all of this. He has heard the words of favor from the Lord. And now here he is in a moment of ease where there appears to be an absence of temptation and he falls. He falls. Matthew Henry writes of Noah. He says that sometimes those who with watchfulness and resolution have by the grace of God kept their integrity in the midst of temptation have, through security and carelessness and neglect of the grace of God, been surprised in the sin when the hour of temptation has been over. Listen to what he says. Noah, who had kept sober in drunken company, is now drunk in sober company. Let him that drinks, let him that thinks he stands, take heed, Henry says. Friend, keep watch in those moments When you hear that voice in your head saying, you know what, you need some me time. It's okay, disengage. Set your Bible aside for a bit, no need to pray. You can sleep in this Sunday. You deserve a break. You've you've worked hard for the Lord. Friend, be assured that, that in that moment, this is not the voice of the Lord that you are hearing. This is not his voice. I've seen so many pastors over the years in growing churches, exploding churches, outwardly, everything looks like a success, and suddenly you're like, what happened to that guy? He completely crashed and burned in an utterly indefensible way. What happened? He let down his guard. Whether it's alcohol, whether it's mindlessly scrolling on your phone or computer, vegging out in front of Netflix, sitting on the beach, whatever, remember, be on guard against spiritual drift. D.A. Carson says this, he says, People do not drift toward holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate toward godliness, prayer, obedience to Scripture, faith, and delight of the Lord. We drift toward compromise and call it tolerance. We drift toward disobedience and call it freedom. We drift toward superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch toward prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated and fathers there is a warning for us as well we must especially be on our guard I have people tell me all the time oh pastors you you know you we pray for our pastors we pray for our elders and thank you for that 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 is that is a huge blessing to us and we need those prayers but they'll they'll usually follow that with because we know there's a target on your back because if he can take one of you guys out he can take the church with him and so on and so on well i say this fathers you're the pastors of your home if he can take you out he can take your children with him and i have seen again in 21 years of ministry many a family crumble because of a father's sin children who no longer walk with god children who have rejected the faith and hate him Be on your guard. Noah's lack of watchfulness opened a door of opportunity for his son to sin. Is there any way that this might be true of us? Is there something that maybe you're involved in, fathers, that that you you think you've kept hidden? Maybe the use of pornography, maybe an emotional relationship at work, dishonest business dealings. Something of that nature that if it were brought to light would bring shame and humiliation not just upon you but upon your children to open the opportunity of sin for them. It matters, friends, how we walk before our children. And we see the consequence of Noah's fall played out in the action of his own son in verse 22. Notice, here we see the shameful sin of Ham. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Ham, like his father and brothers, had heard the call of God. He had had a hand in building and constructing the ark. 
He had heard God promise to rescue them from the judgment that was to come. He had witnessed that judgment, and he exited the ark with his father, with his mother, with his wife, and his brothers. God had established the covenant with him as well. Chapter 9, verse 8 and 9, remember, then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring. But in spite of all of this, Ham, when he saw his father exposed in his tent, went outside, it says, and told his brothers. Now, the details are sparse here. There's been a lot of speculation. Some have speculated that that Ham must have done something horrible to his father, something even on the borderline of incestuous. And and I think we do that because, and this is my assessment of it, that for us, nakedness is not that big of a deal anymore. If you don't believe me, just go to Rehoboth Beach in the summertime. Nakedness is surely not something we're shocked by. We see it on television. We don't bat an eye when it's on the screen. And so we think that just seeing his father's nakedness couldn't have been the sin. It had to be something worse than that. No, actually, it was. I believe it was that. He dishonored his father. His father's nakedness was exposed and he dishonored him. The exposure of one's nakedness in the Bible is described as exceedingly shameful. The priests in, in, in the book of uh, Exodus, we are told that the priests were not permitted to walk up the steps of the altar unless they had had their, their robes tied up in such a way that they were not exposed. Uh, an entire chapter of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 18, speaks about the uncovering of nakedness and the, forbidden, uh, the, the fact that it's forbidden to uncover one's nakedness. Your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your wife, and all of these shameful things of uncovering one's nakedness nakedness of course also it it would seem to me it would be unlikely to had that had ham done something horrific incestuous in nature with his father that he it's unlikely would have gone out and told his brothers about it i think what's going on here is that ham has dishonored his father he is he has not turned away from his father's humiliation and shame and his nakedness and furthermore he went out and he told his brothers in a mocking and jeering way, <laughs> look, look at dad. Do you see this? So much for the man of God. Preacher of righteousness. Look at that dude. I mean, can you believe that? He was guilty of a gross violation of what would later be enshrined in the law of Moses as the fifth commandment. You shall honor your father and your mother. I think the best way of putting this, and I was trying to think of what, what this might be the equivalent of today, and, and, and the best I could come up with is this. Imagine for a moment you find your father or your mother in a shameful state, a state of shame, a state of sin, and, and you take pictures with your phone and you post it on the Instagram uh, account, your Instagram account, with a, ca- with, a, with a caption, blameless in his generation, R-O-T-F-L. That's the equivalent, I think, of what Ham has done here to his father. He has made a mockery of him. Imagine the contempt that one must have for their father to do something like this. Of course, when Ham tells his brothers, they do not join him in his mockery. They say, Ham, what are you doing? This is our father. He, he, he has lived faithfully before us. He has taught us what it means to walk with God. He, he led us to salvation on the ark. And, and this is how you treat him? This is your response? Yes, he has sinned, but the sin of our father is not an occasion to mock him, but to cover him. Look at verse 23. Notice the respect and the reverence that they show for their father. It's it's interesting that the sin of Ham is stated in a very brief little part of a sentence. But you get you the, the story slows down with Shem and Japheth. Notice, then Shem and Japheth took a garment, they laid it on both of their shoulders, they walked backwards, and they covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces, it says, were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. Their actions are described in great detail because they are the actions of honorable sons. Yes, Noah made a mistake. Noah sinned. Regardless of the intentional nature of that sin, when Noah took that first drink, he knew the the potential consequences of what could come. 
But Ham gloried in his father's sin, whereas Shem and Japheth covered their father's sin. When Noah sinned, Ham refused him mercy. Shem and Japheth extended grace to him. And friends, what a lesson here for all of us. I am so troubled by the number of adult children I know who refuse to speak to their parents. That is deeply troubling. And I'm not talking about people who have been severely abused by a parent where there is probably a legitimate reason to, to not have a relationship. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about parents who, yes, maybe have sinned against their child in some way or have inadvertently offended them. And that child derides or mocks their parent, refusing to acknowledge them, refusing to speak to them. Friend, if that's you here today, I got a message for you. Repent. Repent. There's an explicit command of God in Scripture for you. Honor your father and your mother. Not because they were perfect, not because they did everything right, but because they are your father and your mother, and God has placed them over you. Instead of looking and criticizing, look for evidences of grace in their life. Look for the ways that maybe God has been working in them, and praise the Lord for that. Find things to be thankful for. Because to dishonor your parents is to dishonor God himself. Do not repeat the sin of Ham and refuse them mercy. Extend grace to them. Cover them. Cover their sin as Shem and Japheth covered their father's sin. Do not post on social media about your parents' failures. Don't tell other people how awful they were or are. Don't stir up dissension among your siblings and extended family. Friends, this is shameful. I mean, think about it. Consider your own sins and failings. How would you want your own children to deal with you and your sins and your failures? More importantly, how has your heavenly Father dealt with you in your sins and your failings? Of course, this principle extends beyond parents and children, right? We understand that. Matthew 18, if your brother sins, go to him alone, just the two of you. Galatians 6, if your brother, someone's called in a sin and a snare, restore him gently, right? So the framework for dealing with the sins of other people is to deal with them directly and gently. Deal directly with the offender and gently with the offender. Don't go outside. Don't tell your brothers. There are things that the Lord hates. One of them we know very clearly. God hates those who stir up dissension among the brothers. So in the context of the local church, and let me say this again, it's important to understand this. If someone has sinned, if someone offends you, you don't go tell others what has happened. You don't build a team. You don't stir up dissension among the brothers. You go to that individual and you speak to them. Why? Because it could all be a misunderstanding. And, and, and if, if it's a misunderstanding, you have now slandered your brother and sister to other people for no good reason. You have taken an offense that you were to bear and you have thrown it on their shoulders and they can do nothing about it. That is not restorative in nature. You go to your brother, you go to your sister, and you go to them directly. Matthew chapter 18 is explicitly clear upon, uh, on this subject. Do that with your parents. Do that with your children. Do that with your spouse. Brothers and sisters, do not tolerate this kind of dissension in the midst of the congregation or in the midst of your family. It is a cancer that destroys unity and undermines honor. When Noah awakens from his drunkenness, he realizes what has happened to him, we're told. He realizes what his sons have done, Ham as well as Sham and Japheth. And he utters what are the first prophetic words from human lips in the Bible. Look at verse 25 where we see the curse and blessing of nations. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. Now, in verses 18 and 19, we are told that Shem, Ham, and Japheth are not merely three brothers, right? We know this. But they are the heads of all the peoples of the earth. Look back at, at verse 19. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Now, that's also setting us up for chapter 10, where you find this long 
list of names known as the Table of Nations, the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, from whom all the people of the earth came. And that leads us into the Tower of Babel and that story and all. There's some, uh, we'll look at that in the coming weeks. But everyone who has lived on the earth following the flood has descended from these men. All the nations of the earth trace their lineage to them. Shem is the father of the Semitic people, those who would be Jews and also what we would know as modern Palestinian people. They all descended from Shem. Right? Shem was the great, great, great grandfather of Terah. Terah was the father of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, even Abraham had, was the father of Isaac and Ishmael, the Semitic people. So Shem is the father of the Semitic people. Ham is the ancestor of the Eastern people and the African people and the Canaanites, whom we read about much, uh, much more in uh, following the Exodus. And Japheth is the ancestor of the Indo-European people. He's the father, in many ways, of Western civilization, you might even say, through his son, uh, for, through his son Javan. But it's important to note that when Noah pronounces this curse and pronounces this blessing, he's not only pronouncing it upon them, but also upon their descendants. Furthermore, it's important to understand that when Noah pronounces this, this is not a fit of anger, and Noah's just throwing out words. Because these words, Noah's words have no power. It is the authority of God in these words that has power. And hence, this is recognized to be a prophecy. A prophecy of God through Noah speaking judgment upon Ham and his son Canaan. And also blessing upon Shem and Japheth. And it is interesting to note here. And many have been puzzled by the fact that the curse is not upon Ham himself. Nor is it upon all of his sons, but his one son. His one son, Canaan. You see, he does not directly curse Ham, but his son. We see something like this in, in the Old Testament, right? We know that Solomon sinned, and God did not pronounce judgment on Solomon per se, but that judgment fell upon, upon his son, Rehoboam, and the kingdom was taken from him. Something similar here, Ham has four sons. According to chapter 10, verse 6, his four sons are Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. But yet only Canaan, the youngest, was cursed. And there's no real explanation for this, so to try to find one could, could get us down some rabbit trails. No reason is given. Perhaps maybe Ham, there's a connection between Ham being the youngest of the three sons. She, the Bible says Shem, Ham, and Japheth, but actually Ham is the youngest son, not the oldest, not the middle son. He's the youngest. And so his youngest, God meets judgment out upon his youngest son. Maybe there's a connection there. We're not sure. But Cush, the sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, and Put, all settled on the African continent. And Canaan and his people settled in the region of what would eventually become the promised land. If you go to chapter 10, you find out that um, Canaan was the, 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 the father of the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, all the peoples that God had told the Israelites to destroy and drive out of the land, the land of Canaan. They would be driven out of the land because of their wickedness. You remember when, you'll see this coming up in Genesis 15, when God makes a covenant with Abraham. He tells Abraham that your descendants will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and I will judge that nation, the nation of Egypt, right? Which ironically is one of the sons of Ham. Egypt, the people of Egypt will be judged, and they, I will deliver your people and bring them to a land, at, but only after 400 years. Why? Because the iniquity of the Amorite, Another descendant of Ham is not yet complete. So you see all this coming together. Now remember, when, when was Genesis written? Who's the author of Genesis? Moses. Moses is compiling Genesis. He's writing this record down. While the children of Israel are wandering in the wilderness, preparing to go into the land of what? Canaan. So there's, their understanding of this story is not just history, but very real. That these people, the Canaanites, because of this curse, are slaves to us, as it were. They will not stand against us. That gives you a little bit of insight into why Joshua and Caleb were so confident and wanted to go into the land. They knew this story. They understood it. And they believed it. The other ten spies did not. 
But the fulfillment of this curse of Canaan was seen in the constant subjugation of the Canaanites by their brothers, the Egyptians, meaning literal brothers, and the people of Mesopotamia, but also by the children of Israel who would drive them out. In time, the Canaanites would be completely wiped out as Israel took the land. So let me pause very briefly. There is a, a, an aberrant view that has existed, existed in, especially in the South, uh, in the United States during the era of slavery, that, that this was a justification for slavery because the descendants of Ham were the African peoples, and therefore they were meant to be slaves. It was promised in the Bible. That is, you cannot get that interpretation from Scripture. This is, that is a twisted view. The African peoples, yes, were descendants of Ham who settled on the African continent. But uh, the descendants of Ham, the descendant of Ham who was cursed was Canaan. Canaan was the one who settled in the land of Canaan and was ultimately driven out and destroyed by his brothers and by the children of Israel. Noah curses Ham's son, Canaan. But he blesses his son Shem and Japheth. And he blesses their descendants. But it's interesting, there's a distinction here. I want you to look at the language used here in the wording, right? Notice the first, uh, notice the, the language of the blessing of Shem. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. You notice something about the word Lord, right? We, we, you, if you study the Old Testament, anytime you see the word Lord in all caps, it is the, the, the proper name of God, Yahweh, the covenant name of God. So he says, blessed be the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Shem. So he's clearly saying that this, this man, Shem, God is going to have a special relationship with him. And as we will see in the following weeks, Abraham will, will see descends from the line of Shem. And through Abraham comes Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who will be called Israel. The children of Israel will descend from Shem. And Yahweh will be the covenant God of Shem and of his descendants, Israel. Everything that we're reading now is setting us up for Genesis chapter 12 with the call of Abram and Genesis chapter 15 with the covenant of Abram. The whole Old Testament is being set up here to give us context and understanding for everything that is to follow. God is going to have a special relationship with Shem's descendants. Yahweh will be their God. What is being foretold here, again, is the selection of Shem's descendants through Abraham, as the chosen people of God. But the blessing is more than the call of Abraham because it looks ahead to the one who would come and be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Friends, Jesus Christ is the descendant of Shem. He is the Lord of Shem. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Shem. What does Jesus, the name Jesus mean? Yahweh saves. God is going to send salvation through Shem, through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through David, ultimately through Jesus Christ. And we know that Shem's descendants would not be the dominant power on the earth. That's, what the, that's the irony in all of this story. It wasn't because they were this great people that God chose them to raise, raise up salvation for the, for the world. Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, he says, It was not because you were more in number than any people that the Lord chose you and set his love on you. You were the fewest of all the people. You were, you were the least likely, but yet God set his love upon you. Shem's descendants would not be great, earthly speaking, but from them would come the salvation of not only the line of Shem, but to all the people of the world. And we see this in the blessing of Japheth. Look at the blessing of Japheth. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. The prophecy here is that Japheth will spread out and expand on the earth. And friends, that prophecy is proven true. This is incredible that this was, this was written thousands upon thousands of years ago before these nations were, were even a thing. They were, the seed of these nations were in three individuals, and this prophecy is made. Who comes from Japheth ultimately? Javan. He's, Javan is the one through whom his descendants would ultimately become the people of Greece, through whom, ironically, the New Testament would come in their language. Isn't that fascinating? The language of the Old Testament is found in the language of Shem, the Semitic language is Hebrew. And the language of the Gospels would come through the line of Japheth when it was finally written in the Koine Greek New Testament some thousands of years later. Those people who descended from Japheth's son, Javan. 
the Indo-European peoples, the, those who would ultimately be known as the, 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 uh, the establishers of Western civilization. The, think about the great explorations, the great conquests, the colonizing of the nations. All of that came through the line of Japheth. May Japheth be enlarged. And it has happened. And do you see how all of these prophecies have been fulfilled? Canaan was enslaved, conquered, and ultimately blotted out. Shem was the line through whom salvation came. From Abraham to Jesus, whose name means Yahweh saves. Japheth, the line through whom the greatest empires arose to dominate the earth. But then Noah says one more thing, and this is wonderful. Notice, let Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem. You see, Japheth is going to come under the shelter of Shem. He's going to share in his inheritance in some way. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that he's going to literally live in Shem's tent. It means that in some way, Japheth is going to find shelter under Shem's line. He is in some way going to be sheltered by him. And we know how that happened, right? Now, those words must have sounded strange, even cryptic, when they were first uttered, but as the redemptive story of Scripture unfolds, we see the Lord of Shem was not, was not the Lord of Shem alone. He was the Lord of all men. He did not come to bring salvation to the descendants of Shem alone, but to all the peoples of the earth. Jesus, the son of Shem, think about this, friends, Jesus, the son of Shem, would be born under the rule of Caesar Augustus, a son of Japheth. He would live among his people, the Shemites, but they would receive him not. He would be tried by Pilate, a Japhethite. He would die on a cross created by the Japhethites. And he would be laid in a tomb. And he would rise from the dead three days later and would ascend into heaven. And then just 50 more days after that on Pentecost, a group of uneducated Galileans, a group of Shemites who had been with Jesus, would proclaim the gospel not only to their fellow Shemites, the Jews, but they would also invite the Japhethites, the Gentiles, to come and dwell in the tents of Shem, to dwell in the tents of Yahweh, to experience his salvation. Friends, that is our story today. By God's grace, you and I have been invited into the tents of Shem. We find shelter in the tents of Shem. Do you remember the words of Noah, his father, Lamech? Remember that long genealogy, and then we come to the end, and we read this. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. And the word Noah was a play on words, which means rest in Hebrew. The rest that Lamech longed for, friends, has come. The great, 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 Times however many grandson of Noah, Jesus Christ came to this earth and he said this, come to me all you who are labor, all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you what? Rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Friends, your salvation is not an accident. It is not a footnote in history. It's the purpose for which he came. God is sovereign over all of human history. And he planned your salvation and my salvation and the salvation of all of his people all the way back in the beginning. Genesis 3.15, the snake crusher. Genesis chapter 9, cursed be Canaan, but blessed be Shem, the Lord God. Bless the Lord God, the God of Shem. May God enlarge Japheth. and May he dwell in the tents of Shem. All of that was predicted thousands upon thousands of years ago. And here we are today gathered together in this place. The majority of us, Japhethites. Certainly maybe a few Shemites in the mix. But the reality is this. We have all come under the shelter of the tents of Shem through Jesus Christ. And friend, if you're here this morning, I would implore you this morning to put your faith and trust in him. In Jesus Christ who came to this earth to undo the, the curse of sin and the penalty of sin and the power of sin over you. He died on a cross, a cross you should have died on, I should have died on. He shed his blood when it should have been our blood that was shed for sin. And the Bible says that if you will come trusting in him and him alone and what he has done, 
He will forgive you, not just partial forgiveness so that you got to work the rest of it off, but he will forgive you fully and completely and wholly. There will be no sin which we will ever be hold against, held against you again. It is gone, wiped clean, and you will be given new life so that you might walk according to that newness of life. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, a new creature. That's the promise Not a promise that was made yesterday. Not a promise that I came up with this week studying for this sermon. But a promise that was made thousands upon thousands of years ago. A promise that has been heard. And a promise that has been responded to by millions if not billions of the faithful throughout the generations. And I encourage you to put your hope and your trust in him. And believer, let me encourage you. When you, when you see a story like this, when you read of these prophecies in the Old Testament, they, should, they are given there for our instruction, not just our instruction to learn from the example of Noah's drunkenness and Ham's sin and Japheth's uh, honorable conduct, but they're there also to remind us of the promises of God, that God is working and weaving redemption throughout human history. All of it is, is working, and, and, and you were born on this earth, and God brought the gospel to you. Acts, Acts chapter 17 says that he ordained the place you would live, your boundaries, the number of years you would live, and the era in which you would live, so that you might find him. That's, that's how personal this God is. That he would set his love upon you and me. That is incredible. You, you heard the old, the old Gaither song, Right, my, my grandfather, I think he always wanted us to sing that here. But it's not a congregational song. But it was when I was on the cross, or he was on the cross, I was on his mind. So true, beautiful song. But I would say this. When Noah blessed Shem and Japheth, I was on his mind. When the promise of the snake crusher was made, I was on his mind. Before the foundation of the world, I was on his mind. And friend, if he is calling you today, respond. Today is the day of salvation, the scriptures tell us. See, it's so beautiful when you go to the New Testament and you begin to read the letters of Paul. He keeps speaking about this mystery, the mystery of salvation, the mystery to the Gentiles. That's what he's talking about. This this amazing mystery that, that was weaving down that nobody could really perceive. Nobody understood exactly what God was up to, like we sang this morning, right? I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. And that's the story of the Bible all the way through. And then suddenly Jesus comes. And then Jesus gives this revelation of the gospel to the apostles. And the apostles proclaim this good news, this wonderful mystery that had been hidden for the ages has now been revealed to you in Christ Jesus. And We are the recipients of that. And I encourage you this morning, trust in Christ and Christ alone. He is the Savior. And if he has set his love upon you, the hound of heaven has set his, his love upon you. He will pursue you until you believe. Let's pray.